Greetings in the name of the Most High. Yes. Well, there's got to be a way to get through it. And um, we've been in uncharted territory for the last couple of years, or last, well, ever since we got really on the air, we've been talking about getting into the uh, the last bit or, or a new time. And we called it like the rising of the lambs, the healing of the body. It, it doesn't include the 501c3 churches usually just because not that healings can't go on in the midst of that, but that there's a compromise involved. And the compromise is legal. You know, it's um, a violation of the legal uh, law of the word of God that says, uh, do not be friends with the world. Anyone who is friends with the world is an enemy of God, as it says in uh, John's writings, and it also says in James 4.4, 4, calling people that are friends with the world adulterers and adulteresses. The book of Revelation, furthermore, is has a central theme, okay? And the central theme basically is for the children of God to come out of the church of Babylon. In other words, come out of the corruption of the church because the corruption of the church is uh, the fact that Satan rules over it or, if you will, the world rules over it. And though the church may still be involved in good things, it is... Um, it is... Um, impossible for one to serve God and stay within the confines of man-made institutions like the church or, you know, businesses, politics. And then there's nothing wrong. You know, I'm not saying there's something terribly, terribly wrong with church. You may have a church you go to that uh, you the, the last thing you would expect to see there is a satanic worship, a satanic affiliation, a satanic... Uh, you, you know, uh, uh, a twisting of the word of God to make it that you would do Satan's bidding and think it's the Lord's bidding. You may It may not be exactly on that particular level, but still it's the same kind of thing. In other words, there's an affiliation with the world. There's a permission. And this is what I saw at the uh, Calvary Chapel. There were agents or people keeping dossiers on people that were affiliated with the government of the United States, who were there as plants pretending to be elders and workers of the church. They turn out to be, you know, like undercover FBI agents and things like that, who were basically spying on people there. And they were perfectly welcome because they had permission to be there. They had permission to be there. And you'd never know, I mean, I outed one and the Calvary Chapel immediately got rid of the person the next day. And he wound up in another church, um, not far from the, the original one, but it was all because I told someone that he was an FBI agent or some, some such, I'm not sure I said FBI, but I said something. And the next day he was gone, which proved that it was a very sensitive issue that the church leadership, that is the pastor, the pastor's wife, <clears throat> the music director, or the worship leader and others knew this guy was a plant and keeping records on people who are there. In other words, the entire establishment from the pastor on down was using the church to spy on people and to enter their homes and basically mind control them, you know, to doing the bidding of the church. In other words, conforming to what they felt you should conform to, which was basically the world. And that means demonic possession uh, you know, demons take over. That means there's not a, you know, they take over and then rituals occur when people are no longer there possessed or even become almost like clones of what they were. And then they'll call that being born again, which is anything but being born again. And I've seen this over and over and over and over. I seem to see that most people in ministry are being used by the dark side. I'd say, I said most people in ministry are being used to corrupt those that may be really truly of the Lord 
within their midst if they should have anyone held captive in that way. It all has to do with uh, tremendous bondage, mind control, slavery, and it's worse in the churches than it is anywhere else. Though, you know, anyone's sin like a, you know, coveting of money or anything like that will, will leave one susceptible. Uh, coveting of, you know, you know, all the basic sins will open you to it. And why the people stay there is because they're insecure. They don't want to be without friends. And so they put up with it. The same corruption and conformity that is seen in the music business, entertainment, uh, and everywhere else, private you know, clubs and so forth, they will stay in it even though they know it's corrupt because they don't want to be out in the cold. And therefore the compromise sets in and you know, then they find themselves involved in doing nefarious things that are kept secret. And once they're part, a party to a secret, then they can be compromised uh, completely or blackmailed. And then they're held there in bondage through blackmail and fear. And, you know, and they're, they're just desperate people that they don't know how to get out. They, they went to the Lord, they found the Lord, the Lord found them. And then they went and, and, you know, gave it all up to a group of people that said, we are of Jesus and we are the church, submit to us. They did. And now they find that they can't leave because they have, they have, confessed sins or done things that uh, would be illegal, let's say, or things that they wanted to keep secret. Now it's a known secret. And so due to that secret being exposed that they could get in trouble, they stay there. And whoops. Okay, are we still going? Yes, we are. Okay. So that they would stay there. And um, unfortunately, in that context of staying there, um, they devolve more and more into, say, kind of a surfacey religion that uh, that basically is a, like, you know, so, uh, we could just call it a mind-controlled kind of a religion, um, where it's really more about slavery, which they'll then call obedience to God, but it's really slavery to the group that's in, in power. Now, this happens, you know, around the world and has for, this has been the, the, the major problem. Whereas that people that follow the Lord typically wind up being vagabonds because if they won't put up with that level of control, if they come out of her, you know, come out of the whore, the whore of Babylon, that is. Then what ends up happening, and, and really the book of Revelation, when it says the whore of, of Babylon, it's talking about the religious system as well as the si system of commerce. Both are equal and one and the same. Commerce, religion, etc. It doesn't mean you can't do commerce. It doesn't mean you can't visit a church. It doesn't mean, it just means to take, really, it begins with an oath. You are to take no oaths with anybody. So when you become a member of something, you're taking an oath whether you know it or not. You say, well, I'm just becoming a member, but you're agreeing to rules and different things. You're agreeing to submit to that group or that body. Therefore, legally, legally, I'm not talking about any other, you know, uh, kind of thing except legally. Legally, you become uh, beholden to a situation that is um, unacceptable to God according to his word. Uh, unacceptable to God according to his word. And so, uh, <laughs> in Revelation 18, it says, And I heard another voice come from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you not be partakers of her sins, and that you not receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Remember her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her as she... Uh, double according to her works in the cup which she had filled to her double. In other words, there's going to be uh, wrath. And wrath can take the form of, you know, a fantastic wrath, meaning, you know, a destruction of the earth type of wrath. It can take on another one, though, which is basically the wrath of being enslaved. Get out of her, my people, you, for you don't want to be caught and unable to leave because of the power there. When you're dealing with supernatural uh, occultic powers that are really strong in some areas. And uh, 
you know, you have the main things, commerce, religion, politics, uh, military, you know, all these things have, you know, secret societies, okay? So all these have a tremendous amount of power that's greater than the individual. So an individual in Christ with the Holy Spirit could not possibly become a part of corruption. They'll tell you, oh, please but don't be so judgmental. Please don't look around and be judgmental of the other people. Uh, your, your objection to what we're doing here is your own basic uh, intolerance and judgmentalness, which has to be broken. In other words, Jesus is love. Why don't you love your brothers and sisters and help, you know, and the idea there is to assimilate you into uh, a kind of bondage where, you know, you're, you're, you're seen as no different than anyone else because that would be arrogant and that would be, uh, uh, you know, prideful and that would be snobbish and so forth. And, and so become a part of the group because that's what God really wants you to be. And then eventually look the other way and so on and so forth. And I've known people that have been threatened and when this is exposed and then, you know, set up for death. And they'll say, you see, God, and, and these people are very cynical people. I know they run the church thing. They run the whole, you know, they, they promote the rapture theory. They do all this stuff. And they, they teach the Bible. And unfortunately, when they teach the Bible, they avoid every scripture. They misinterpret every single scripture that has to do with what I'm talking about. Every scripture that has to do with the two ways. There's a way that seems right to a man that, that leads to death. Uh, get out of her, my people. You can't be friends with the world and with God. And they, they, you know, the kingdom is within is another one they'll twist because they don't want you to have the kingdom within. They want you to be part of the group. Well, God deals with the individual, not the collective. But without the collective, groups that are religious cannot survive. And it also happens in chat rooms on the internet. It happens, you know, it's not just 501c3. 501c3 is a legal connection to the world or being, a, it, it is a legal manifestation of being a friend of the world. So right from the very charter of a 501c3 church, you have a corruption or a compromise that then can become a cover for breeding of, you know, the lizard, uh, the lizard teen situation, um, which is basically, you know, um, put into bondage, degrade, make people a party to evil, call it good, m the, the, let them think they're doing God's will when they're doing Satan's bidding. Um, and then, you know, the worst are probably the cults, which then say that everyone outside this cult is evil, but we're the only ones that are good. And they keep, you know, we're the only ones that are really with it. And we need to reach the world before it's too late because God's going to come take his church and they're going to be left behind. So we need to really get out there and make sure they know what we do. And us, 25, 30, 40, 50 people, we know what's going on, but it's just so sad that the rest of the world's going to perish. And there are even people that get to the point where they think, it's really our little group here in, you know, um, Colorado or Oklahoma or some little place that has really got it, that really has the word, that has the Lord. And the rest are going to perish. And it's too bad they don't know what we know. And then within those groups, then you have the corruption of the rise of Jezebel, the Jezebel spirit. Um, you know, same thing you have in churches where the, you know, the wives of the pastors wind up running the church which is what we saw again and again and again and again, over and over and over. Uh, that could not happen, could not happen if, uh, if it was a godly situation. It would just be prevented. Because the Lord does put up rails so that his people don't walk off the rails. You know, He puts up guides so that people don't walk off the guides. And when you walk the right walk, and, and it's not a subject of your will, you're just in his power, and that power, him, is what keeps you going. You don't have any power, really, of your own. His power is what keeps you out of, you know, a lot of people uh, complain about having afflictions. You know, Lord, when are you, going to, when are you going to get rid of our afflictions? And, you know, how long do I have to wait? And it's like, well, some of your afflictions are keeping you from becoming a part of that beast system, which is what you're trying to avoid. It's just so ironic that, in the name of Jesus, in the name of, say, church, uh, which doesn't require the Lord sanctioning it, but it's of man. And in the name of, you know, through the seminary system and all that, it becomes the same as the 
uh, vetting as the um, uh, system of degrees. I got a master's degree or whatever. These master's degrees are useless and meaningless to God. It's, it's, a con confer it's, it's conferred by man upon man. And therefore, it's meaningless when it gets into, you know, measuring itself against the word and against God's way and against God's word. It's meaningless. It's great. Someone learns Hebrew. They learn ancient Hebrew, ancient languages. They translate, you know, ancient manuscripts of the Bible and things like that. Great. Uh, you know, nothing wrong with it. But where that affiliation with your school becomes, you know, Jesus or becomes the source of strength, then you have a problem. Your source is coming from the world and not from God. And I'm not suggesting that everyone that really follows God is a vagabond because you can be in it, not of it. In other words, John 17, in it, not of it. You, you could find yourself in a situation where, um, you know, you're in a church, you're in a fellowship, you're in various places, and there will be a day where you'll be called to witness the, the Lord's word against what you might see as iniquity, they will tell you to shut up and not be judgmental, but it will be up to you to either confront them, as I've done, you know, giving a word of the Lord, which I do. Um, I do when I'm given the word, and oh boy, when people mock it, six months later, uh, you check them out, and it's, it's no good. If something really comes from the Lord, you must heed. Capicia. Now in Romans it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As is written for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Okay, so number one, um, you will have tribulation, distress, and persecution. You may have famine or nakedness, poverty, peril, and possibly a sword. You know, think about Muslims persecuting Christians with a sword. It's written, for, for thy sake we are killed all the day long and accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Okay, does that ap apply to the American church? This is... Um, Roman, I'm in Romans 8. Does that, 8, 8, 35 and 36, does that, does that apply? Because that's the standard of what it means to follow Christ. Is that happening in your life? Do you have tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, and peril, or possibly a sword? Uh, those of you who are TIs, you are gang stalked, okay, that's a sword, for it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long and we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Meaning conquering isn't standing up against the sword. Conquering is being killed without renouncing your faith in Jesus. In other words, you you may be killed, but you're going on with the Lord. You've, you've stood your ground. You fought the fight. You ran the race. You won the race. You stayed firm in Christ um, despite... And what, and what would bring on tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and a sword? What would bring those things on? What could possibly bring those things on? It would be your resistance or your unwillingness to conform as when, when told or asked. Told, let's say told. That's when, when signaled to do so, you balk at it and then the response is, because you're in Christ, therefore you're conformed to Christ, you're already conformed. Therefore, what the world will do is tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and a sword. As a result or as a, an effect, a, the cause is you didn't conform. The effect is um, these issues. In the American church, I have not seen any of these occurring with anyone which shows me that they are conformed to the world and not to Christ. And, you know, it's, it's a very, perhaps today it's really more simple. I mean, I've said this message for, in various ways for ever since I was given the unction and the message to give to the world. And, 
and it's not for the purpose of being critical or saying you're not saved. That's between you and the maker, you and the father. It's not up to me to judge whether you're saved or not. You will know, or if you are, I run into a lot of people who just don't know. One way of telling is when you start sharing the word of God, do you really get into it and do you, do you get all excited about it? Are you really excited to share the word or not? Now it also says in God's love that spirit will also help in our infirmities. It doesn't say you won't have infirmities. It says the spirit will help. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit itself makes intercession for us. In other words, we may not know there's danger up ahead. We not, may not know there's a a tumor or something ready to kill us. We may not know a lot of things with our health, let's say. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knows that in the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good for those that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. If you are in these affiliations, and your focus is completely on God and your love of God, and you share that with brothers and sisters, I don't see a problem with that. It's when you are asked to do things or affiliate in some way that shifts the focus, at not only with you, but also God's focus on you, shifts it to the um, organization that you're a part of. And then it, that the leaders of that organization become your pastors, literally, not Jesus through them, but they literally are, you know, the, 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 in charge. And they will tell you what to think and how to study, and they're the experts and you're not. At that point, you have a problem because when you have the Holy Spirit, you are an expert in the Word. You don't need instruction from anyone. Uh, no, I know the Bible talks about don't resist instruction. Of course, of course, don't resist, resist instruction when, it's, uh, when the unction comes from God. But if it's coming from man, resist instruction because it's going to be wrong. It's all going to be about you being obedient to man and not to God, even though it could be a very subtle distinction to where it doesn't seem like they're asking you to do anything so evil. But it always starts with a little bit, you know, come to the, this, do that, go to this, you know, you'll be at this or a bake sale or this, little things that you're ordered to do. And then eventually it goes into other things like, um, oh, well, don't be so judgmental if you see some kind of sin in your, in your fellowship that is a deal breaker and they tell you to look the other way on it. And then before you know it, they'll be asking you to do the same thing because they're going to want to have something on you in order to keep you there. And in exchange for your bondage there, they will promise you, you know, business connections or, you know, some way of um, enhancing your lifestyle. For if you, we live after the flesh, still working in Romans 8, if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if we through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, we shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And, you know, so it goes on to say that the physical and sowing to the physical and being obedient to the physical and craving the physical and really obsessing on the physical uh, focusing on money, focusing on health, you know, too much, any of those things, um, you're focusing on the realm of death and you're not trusting the Father to take care of those things. He knows your afflictions. But, and I've done a lot of thinking about this, and this is really important. A lot of the afflictions that we have, some of them are there from the Lord as a protection to keep you out of um you know, something that could suck you in and, and destroy your faith or just get you on the wrong track. Sometimes when you're kept lonely and alone and, and isolated or separate from the, 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 the connection of connections to the whole enchilada out there, uh, the Lord's going to keep you separate. And, you know, so some of you complain about being, um, you know, sick or being overweight or being, you know, not having you know, not having what uh, the other guy being jealous or I don't know what it would be, but whatever would be, make you kind of recluse yourself is not necessarily a bad thing. It just means the Lord is perhaps saying, and I'm just speculating here in your case, that, you know, you may not be ready for prime time. If you showed up all, you know, all in tip top shape and everything else, you might get sucked in. 
And so keeping you separate might involve you not being at your best or feeling like you have to hide yourself away or feeling you're not as good as the other people. And that, I've seen this over and over again, where that can be a tactic of the Lord to keep you separate from that that's going on because you have a weakness where you want to be popular, you want to be liked, you want to be loved. Well, that want to be loved thing can get you into a connection with the world, which will then, you know, because you'll want more, right? And then you'll have to do other things to get it. And pretty soon, you know, in order to get that love, you'll be a part of the of the world system. And um, you'll justify it by saying, well, before I just had no one to talk to and I, you know, and my body was in terrible shape and I was uh, sinning all the time and now I'm not sinning and body's in great shape, got better income and things are really going well. My family's all getting along and, you know, I mean, isn't God great? No, what happened was you gave in and you got the benefits of that collective um, power because of your corruption or your separation from God. Um, there are rewards, in other words, to keep you away from God so that you would not be saved in the end, i.e. you would not be counted amongst the sheep because you have gone over. And then, therefore, to keep you on the hook and keep you from repenting back to where you were, they will make it part of your testimony of how you were so awful and things were so messed up, but now you've seen the light and you've come into the group and the collective and uh, you're in the body of Christ now and things are really going well. Well, what happened to being persecuted? What happened to being infirm? What happened to be, you know, what happened to those limitations that reclused you? What happened to those things that separated you? Nothing separates us from the love of God, but God will use different things to separate us based on our weaknesses because he knows that the, the, it's a human trait to want to be connected. It's, it's a human need to want to connect with other humans and be part of the group. It's a human need. So the, well, the way of God is counterintuitive to the way of man. Man wants to bond with man and is willing to overlook or do the other. And, you know, the great example of this would be, say, the Masons who, when they get into a court of law, they are not allowed to say the truth. If, if a brother sinned or did something illegal, they're not allowed to testify against that person because they're Mason brothers, okay? That's well known. That's a perfect example and a, a quintessential example, a specific example of what I'm talking about. And to a lesser degree, that goes on in most affiliations and associations worldwide. You cover for your friends. If the guy murders somebody and they want to have a grand jury investigation, you say you didn't see anything if you're in the same brotherhood. Okay, but that would be anathema to God. In other words, what would be the way of God? It would be um, that you are beholden to God and to one another, we're, we're children of God, we're brethren, we're sons of God, sons and daughters of the Most High God. And, you know, but it doesn't mean that we look the other way on, on you know, sin or look the other way on things that would be deal breakers with God. For example, when Moses encountered them worshiping the golden calf after returning from the mountain, and knowing how displeased God would be, and knowing that the whole group could perish because of these 3,000, he immediately put out the order to slay them all, and that may sound very cruel, but he had to kill them all in order to save the, the, the main body of believers, the main body of the brethren. He had to kill that cancer, those people, because they had affiliated with evil. And you can just imagine, they're worshiping the golden calf in the midst of um, you know, getting revelation from Yahweh. Okay, and then they're covering for one another. You know, no, we didn't do that. You know what I mean? And you can see them going underground with it if, if it were, was allowed to fester. And it was known that, well, don't do anything overt, but uh, keep it on the down low. And, and then it becomes, uh, yeah, we're covering for one another. Well, I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. And before you know, oh, don't be so judgmental. Isn't it the way? Of, then they start twisting the scriptures. Isn't the way of God, you know, to, to be loving and, and, and cover for our brethren? You know, the love of God covers a multitude of sins. So therefore, we should cover for one, one another. And then, you know, dishonesty creeps in. And pretty soon, no one's being honest about anything. 
the whole thing is off the track, and then that's where the Jezebel spirit comes in. Then the witches take over the Jezebel spirit, and then they run the men, and then the rest is history. Moses knew he had to just kill them. Moses knew uh, most of the end times prophets today are talking about God's just going to smack the whole nation down then because this has gone this way. America has gone this way. America has gone to Jezebel. If you throw out the word of God, you get Jezebel, meaning the whole Luciferian programming. You get that program. And basically it's, I will give power to those who help me accomplish my bidding, which is to destroy humanity. Um, perfect example, Barack Obama. I will destroy humanity. And to the extent that you help me destroy humanity, I will reward you with, with powers of the kingdom. Okay? The powers of the kingdom of darkness. You will wield those powers so long as you help, you know, destroy wealth, destroy people, you know, conform them, bring a totalitarian state. To the extent that you do that and even commit genocide or drone attacks uh, on uh, people and innocent people like the families of, say, so-called terrorists and whatnot, I will reward you and bump you up because you've done human sacrifices now for me. I'm going to boost you up. I'll make you a king of the world. We deal with this with Obama every day, you know, a very inexperienced person, you know, incompetent pretty much, who uh, seems to be getting off on, you know, drone attacking people to the extent where he's making his own lists of uh, targets he wants to take out without due process, ironically, after having gone to Harvard Law School. <laughs> it's not, I mean, and then you have people defending him, which is indefensible. There's no defense for that. It's outright murder. Just a few years ago, the CIA was not supposed to murder anyone. Remember, people said, no, we're, that's against the law. Now we're droning. We're, we're just openly doing it on television. Um, that could not happen in a godly society. That could not happen with good people. Okay, people that are good would be at least beholden to their morals. Um, you know, this is kind of like in a, in a little bit of of apologetics about what it means to serve God and what it means to serve the world, one litmus test you can take is, is there persecution? Are there places you can't go? Are there things that happen supernaturally when you go certain places that you shouldn't go that almost kill you, even though you can't see it? Is there, are there dangers out there that you need to be avoiding and that the Spirit has to guide you away from? Dangers that weren't there before you serve God. If the answer is no, then you're not serving God. Period. If there isn't persecution and the rest of it, you know, there's just places you can't go. I mean, I remember we tried to go to a concert at one time in Colorado, and then all of a sudden they had to take the car to the mechanic, and then they started manifesting, and then weird vans started driving by. All kinds of weird, like, almost like gang stalking type of events happened, but they were supernatural. You know, and then, you know, we had to um, escape it and we couldn't go to a concert because the way was blocked. And then we were sort of chased out of this area in Colorado and it just, you know, and we had to kind of take shelter, but we were, we had a real battle on our hands with, with suddenly just out of the blue, out of nowhere. Okay, things like that, or even to a certain extent, you go to a rock concert, what happens? The whole point of it, if you're dealing with rock from the say the '70s especially, is to the lyrics and the and the whole uh, thing is to conjure up. It's a it's a service. It's a religious service to conjure up Satan and the demons to possess everyone in the concert and get everyone flowing in the same mind, and then programming takes place, hive mind programming, and then those people go home with those demons or whatever from the rock concert, and then they spread those throughout, you know, um, their lives. And the, the point of that is to get them under control, to get them in a form of bondage, to get them wearing the certain clothes, dressing a certain way, having a certain hairstyle, having a certain take on the world, having a certain way of being. Now, and getting that to spread to everyone so there's a certain agreed upon nod, nod, wink, wink way of being that was actually inculcated from the rock concert. But don't worry, there's the newspaper, there's the rock, there's any kind of avenue. There's movies, 
that seek to do the same thing, seek to become religious services on behalf of the dark kingdom. And they're just programming mechanisms for the purpose of keeping you obedient. And that's how they were able to take God out of the United States, by simply over advertising, pop culture, Hollywood, music especially, they were able to have everyone throw their morals out, or more, their moral, but morals based on the word of God out, and the idea of right and wrong out, to now where you have people, if they get a result they don't like in an election or something, uh, they'll riot and break everything there is. They have absolutely no compunction about private property. Uh, the mob, you will burn their cities down. They will, they, they've gotten to the point where at this point there's no restraint on them. But again, it was slowly programmed over generations, uh, over you know many years, to get them to rebel against God. And then once they're free, you know, they think, then they are caught up in the high mind where they can't rebel against the conformity that they have conformed to. And because anyone that does gets, gets hammered down. So they then do the bidding of the world or of Satan and they do it in their daily lives at work, you know, and then when they're triggered, when that day comes where the society breaks down, they will likely be, you know, you've seen the Occupy Wall Street movement. It's a perfect example of people that, um, the, those people that become vandals and whatnot, they don't really need a reason to do it. They just need the signal. Someone gives a signal and they start breaking windows. Okay, that's basically hive mind conformity, you know, an outward manifestation of it. These are people that have no mind whatsoever. They're just willing dupes that when they're ordered to do something, they just like, they do it. Um, you get enough people like that, and you have lawlessness and a breakdown of society and the end of society. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, the rule of law becomes perverted and then law enforcement just becomes uh, attacking the actual good citizens and leaving the bad ones alone. Notice how they leave the rioters alone from the unions, people breaking the law, they don't touch them. But if you say something, uh, if it, you're anywhere near a conservative or Bible believer and, and you stand up and speak or a protest, they're likely to haul you away while the anarchists are let go. You ever wonder why that is? Because one is serving Satan and one serving truth. The one that's serving Satan is allowed to go and law enforcement will leave them alone. Unless it gets, you know, over the top. But I mean, generally they leave them alone. Law enforcement, another organization that re requires the same connection to the world, the same law of conformity, the same uh, lack of morals. You know, I mean, if you, once you take God out of the equation, it's Katie bar the door, anything goes. Once you become initiated into the satanic realm and connected up with the world, it's anything goes. But then again, you have to do what you're told. Anyone of a higher rank can tell you what to do, sleep with your wife, exploit your kids, do whatever. And you gladly do it because you don't want to lose your seat at the table because materially it's been too good. I can't tell you. It's an individual thing. You know, it's like the individual has choices, temptations, all kinds of things on a daily basis that come up. You know, tell the truth, to lie. Whenever you let sin in, and you just start with little compromises, those end up becoming big compromises later on. You get taken over. And when you resist it, then the spirits come at you and they, they you know, like a lot of pastors and people will, you know, their writings out there about being plagued all night by the devil, whispering in their ear all night how awful they are, how stupid, how perverse, how this or that, you know, how, how dare they think they're of God or whatever. And they just beat them down and beat them down and beat them down. With And, and other people reinforce it until finally... They've lost all their self-esteem and they're being degraded. And it's really hard to stand up to that kind of thing. And, you know, when you're the, the people in the collective laugh at that person saying, why don't you join us and, and just enjoy your life? Now, the thing is, if this were, was another planet with another situation, perhaps we could all enjoy our lives. Maybe that would be the thing. We would go there and we would enjoy our lives. It would just be there. We'd be there for one purpose, pleasure and enjoyment. But that's not the way the world is set up. It's set up with a, uh, a contest, a war, a fight with each person. 
And those who tend to, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with enjoying yourself, enjoy yourself, to, but, but, but remain vigilant that there, that there are sharks out there. There are dangers out there. So like the Gideon's army, you know, when you take the water, you keep your eyes on the perimeter. The war doesn't end just because you're, say, in, on the, the Hawaiian islands and you're having a great time walking around on the beach and this and that. You, but there are people there, people there that would target you. I don't care who you are. You can be the nicest person and you can be completely secular and never had a bad day, totally innocent of all these things. And you can be there and you can be targeted for kidnapping, theft, all kinds of things. You know, I mean, that's the gross point, obvious point. But in a more subtle way, there are spirits wherever you go. And to the untrained person, someone that doesn't know the word of God, those things can jump on you. That happened to me in Hawaii. These local spirits jumped on me. I had to fight them off with like a, they jumped on, they were like winged monkeys in the, in the, in the other dimension. Not quite visible, but you know, they, when they jump on you, you can feel them. And, um, you know, that kind of drove me to uh, drink and everything else. I mean, I was, I was really driven to a state of, uh, of stress. When I was, it was a very enjoyable thing. But what did I did not do? I didn't protect myself. I went out there thinking my troubles are over. I'm having a great time. Um, everything's wonderful. Don't need to protect myself. Everything's great now. Our troubles are over. How many times have you heard that? Our trouble, it's all sailing downstream now. And what happens to the fool who doesn't prepare, who doesn't know dangers lurking around the next corner? That person gets taken out. Happens all the time. The world is at war. The war is conducted by principalities and powers above and beyond this dimension who are using people to conduct the war. And if you're not on their side, then you're their target. If you're just walking around on your own recognizance, you are their target. They don't want that. If you're a virgin to the world system, you're their target. They don't want any virgins to the world system. If you go along with them, you know, they might just kill you anyway just because they can. There's no rhyme or reason to it. There's no guarantee they'll let you live or make you rich. They are out there. They are also within you, speaking all kinds of garbage to your mind, trying to degrade your sense of purpose or your sense of self-worth. Um, we see this with everyone that serves God. They got, constantly get berated by demonic voices, screaming in their ears all night long how awful they are, how ungodly they are, how perverted they are, how stupid they are, how anything you can imagine until they finally start believing it and acting on it. And then at that point, then they try to stoke the fires of that person going into self-destruction. And at that point, they win. And nobody fired a shot. Nobody lifted a finger. The hive knows what's going on with that person because they're sending a lot of it. But nobody sees anything. It's completely legal. Nobody broke the law. That person just degraded and self-destructed because they dared to serve God and not the devil. What the devil loves, of course, is making people think there's no such thing, number one. The second thing is um, taking over the churches. That's the numero uno uh, policy. Wherever that church is or that Bible is, he's going to get in there and run it with all his minions who jump into people and promise them power and uh, success if they uh, kowtow. In other words, if you conform to the world, we'll let you have your church. And you can be a really successful pastor. But you have to deliver the other rest of the flock into my hand. Anyone that doesn't uh, conform, we want to make sure we know them so we can take them out. And then we can widen that, ex that example to be the whole world and all religions all religions in the whole world have the same set of rules. And then if you like, we can take it even further. The same battle, uh, these people have, uh, these demons, these uh, entities have access to our mind and our spirit and, and can get inside of us. Just by going to the wrong place that, you know, perhaps had, had you prayed, you wouldn't have gone there. 
because there was dan there were dangers there waiting to leap on you and get inside you and drive you crazy. But crazy, not random, crazy with purpose and precision and with a plan. And even if you can just imagine very precise scientists and engineers following every single person on Earth in another dimension and in a scientific way going at each one according to each one's weaknesses. Being very scientific about it, very dispassionate about it. This is just the program. We want to eradicate humanity from the Earth, and this is what we do. Anyone who helps us will make them a millionaire and blah, blah, blah. Or powerful. A lot of the people that um, you know run um, the families of Los Angeles and run the people that, that you think are at the top of the scenes are being run by the maids who are uh, high-level um, priestesses of, of evil, of Satan, of you know, witches and so forth. And they, they opt to make a meager living but they're going more for power. They want power over people rather than riches. And there's a lot of people that realize that's a lot more intoxicating than just having money. Although, you know, people may argue, well, you need both. Well, if you have both, but your life is not your own, you get up in the morning and you, you, you do things you think you ought to do, but they're not your thing. They're, you don't even know who you are. You don't even know what you want to do. Everything that you do is programmed by them. You get up in the morning, you go have a certain kind of coffee, you go down to your club, you play some tennis, you do this, you do that, your entire day, you go to the, the, the thing at night, you go out to this restaurant, you sit at the same table, you order something, you talk to friends, you go home, you sleep, you do it again the next day. Okay? 100% not your life. Have you ever considered that that, and could there have been an alternative to your life? Have you ever considered that you're locked in a, in a pattern? You go to a certain restaurant, you drive a certain car, you go to a certain doctor, you do certain things, you have a pattern developed. Let me ask you this question. Is that something that you would do if you were free? If it was an alternative thing? If, is that really what you opt to do? Is that really you doing those things? And I think you'd find in the case of many well-established people, they couldn't answer the question honestly. They could say, of course that's me. But they wouldn't really be able to answer the question honestly. They might say, well, I desire to go do this or have this iniquity over here or have that naughtiness over there because my loins demand it. You know? Um, and then I would say, well, then your loins are really in charge of your life, not you. Your loins are dictating your life and who, and who speaks to your loins? There's a whole um, civilization of beings that speak to the loins, that want those loins to take over so that they can then control what goes on on Earth. Um, and what happens to people that live by their loins, live by the physical desire? They suffer, yes, but they perish. Only the spirit lives. If you're a once born, and this is where Jesus is teaching about being twice born. He said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. A new, a new heart, a new mind. It's God's way, not my way. My way isn't even my way. That's the point. I, there is no my, when Frank Sinatra sung my way, it's a joke. It's pathetic. Frank Sinatra wouldn't know his own way if it bit him in the, in the, in, in the nose. His way was predetermined. It wasn't his way. It was programmed. It wasn't his way. He was programmed to become frank. It wasn't his way. And so when he sings, I did it my way, the sad, pathetic joke is, no, you didn't. You didn't know what your way was. You never had a chance to find out. And I'm just guessing here. I'm just, you know, this, you can apply that to almost all celebrities. So, you know, say John Travolta, some of the Scientologist ones are more obvious. But is, was, is that his way? Is Travolta living his life? Oh, it seems like it's fun having money and having all kinds of uh, fake friends and going to parties and showing up at, uh, you know, being in movies and getting paid millions of dollars, um, whether you deserve it or not. And that, boy, that's, that's nice. Let me get some of that. Well, my troubles are over. Looks like he's having a great time being himself. Is he? I've known people that, that, uh, that seems the more wealthy they get, the more they don't know themselves. They don't know what they would do if they were themselves. 
They don't know what they would do if they had a chance to think. Everything is programmed. Everything is, is falling into a pattern. Everything seems preordained almost. There will be this result. You will step in and play that role and you'll be rewarded for it. How about it? Okay. But what would you do if you were you? I don't know. I've never been me before. And then God will say, but it's not about you, even if you were you. And so to those who have been completely um, destroyed mentally and psychologically, um, it's okay because he gives you a new mind. It's about him. It's his mind. It's about him. It's his purpose. And even if you're on the dark side, you still fulfill his purpose. Whether you know it or not, it's not about you. It's not about any of us. What would you do if you were you? Well, you don't know. You've never been you. The only way you can actually find out who you are is to be in Christ so that you can then be uh, ministered to in the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, to um, tell you that you are loved and that you are a child of God and that you're a son or a daughter of the Most High God and that your purpose, being that, would be to serve God because that would be what you naturally would want to do, being you, and then you would really be you. But in being you, you would give up you or ego and you would become that extension of his will because out of love, that's all you want because that's love. Um, let's say you can move around the co cabin at your own recognizance and you can do whatever you want. You can take out the, you can go, you know, skeet shooting or you can go fishing for marlin or you can, you know, drive around, look at the bikinis or whatever you want to do. Let's say you're allowed to do those things. Um, you know, you had a certain amount of freedom that you could just do whatever you wanted. Uh, the problem with that is time is not on your side. Uh, once you've been around the, the few rides that there are at Disneyland, you've seen it. It's boring. It's time is going by while you're doing those things. Time you can never get back. Is that really the way you want to spend your time? Gratifying yourself? You can't ever get that time back. You're pushing toward death. Did you really live? Did you do the things that you were that, that were in you to do? Or did you even find out who you were? If you find out who you are, I mean, most people would realize they're nothing. The things that you've done don't make you who you are. They are also as dust. Nothing in the end. Nothing that would satisfy because it's all in memory. Well, I won the Heisman Trophy. It's a memory. Was it really you? You can make an argument that it was any number of people. You don't own it. You can't take it. It's past glory. Even when you were there, it didn't quite satisfy. It was slipping away. And then your health failed. And then you got sick and died. What was your life? Now, to some people, that may be perfectly acceptable. But if you're an honest person, it, you, you, you would want to find out why you're here, why you live, what is you? Is you important? Not imp Where do you fit in? And who are you? What would you do if you were you? Um, most people simply react, do what would gratify their flesh, whatever, give them the best option, and sort of try to enjoy it. But the problem is it's the, the, there'll be this voice that keeps gnawing on you saying, this is not really it. This is not really you. You know, just like the Talking Heads song, that's really not my wife, that's not my house. I, I can't even, I feel completely disconnected from it all. What makes you grounded here to the earth? Nothing, you're gonna die. You, there is no such thing as grounding for people. Oh, I'm really feeling grounded. What does that mean? That means you're not feeling oppressed. You're feeling like you, you're where you belong. You're in the group you belong to. You're going to have a little party celebrating how you all belong. And, and then, you know, eventually it's going to devolve into arguments and problems and disassociations and, and diseases and uh, poverty and lack and pain or whatever it's going to be. You know, I'm going to hold on to life for all I can, give it all the gusto I got and uh, ride it right to the end, and, and that's my goal. 
Well, you know, my answer to that is I can prove this in a court of law, legally, that that's not true. Because your goal is irrelevant. You have no goal. You're programmed to want to gratify your flesh. I mean, that's pretty obvious. If that's all you've done in life, you have achieved no goal whatsoever. You've reacted to being here, but you never found out what here is or what you is, if you will. You feel me? So life takes on this kind of like abstract thing, you know, until you finally realize, well, what your purpose is. Then you say, okay, if it's God's will, I'm praying to God, I'm not getting anything back. I don't know what God wants me to do. But you know what? Just that insecurity about it is God's will. You know, not being completely comfortable with your circumstance and not having confidence. Uh, so therefore going to the Lord to try to alleviate that pain that caused, is caused by that, that's a beautiful thing. Not feeling like that you can really trust other people because you're not sure. I mean, like in, in, in ministry, I, I just got an email, it was pretty smart. It was saying, you know, you really can't trust people in ministry because they can be used by the enemy to, to take you down. That's why ministries are, are usually compromised. And it's a really good point. Make your friends outside the ministry was the suggestion. And I was like, you know, from everything I've seen, that's not a bad idea. I have friends outside the ministry, but I, I don't think I can trust anyone really because I, I can't even trust myself completely. So therefore, and then someone wrote me the other day that said, you know, I don't trust you because you said that, you know, Jesus, they were already drunk and partying and then Jesus, then they ran out of wine because they drank it too fast. So Jesus came in and made more wine even better and even stronger than the, the previous wine. So, you know, that's not right. And he said, that was, that was unfermented wine, he said. And so therefore I don't trust you because that was a lie what you said. It was not fermented. And there's... No wine I know of in the Bible that's really unfermented. I, I, I just can't imagine making unfermented wine for a wedding party. Can you? I, I just, that would, that's a concept that is completely foreign to me. The Bible warns about too much wine can make you see strange visions and awful things and don't be drunk with wine because you're going to make bad decisions and it, it's going to go badly for you. You know, in the Proverbs, you know, Solomon warning about um, the excesses of wine and being drunk. But, um, you know, a little wine for your many infirmities, if it was not fermented, I'm not sure what it would do to my many infirmities. I mean, a couple of glasses of wine kind of soothes the pains in, a, in, in someone. You can take an Advil and a glass of wine and whatnot and, and, and you know, have a, 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 a relaxing moment. Your infirmities have been kind of put to rest for a while. Not only that, there's benefits to red wine, it, fermented red wine, that are um, including longevity because I think it takes the stress off the body. I'm not a real big drinker of wine these days, but it just the, the point is, is um, um, and then the Bible talks about strong drink for really traumatic situations, you know, stronger fermented drink, you know, for, 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 for horrific situations. You know, people throw back a you know, shot of whiskey when, you know, to, because they, they're traumatized. Um, yeah. But I was told that I can't be trusted because I said that Jesus provided un, uh, a rather fermented wine. And it couldn't have, the, the case being, the point, the legal point I think he's trying to make is, it couldn't have been fermented because he, when you just make the wine right off the spot, like the miracle, it wouldn't have had time to ferment. You're talking about the God here. If he wants to just you know, fill those uh, big bowls with wine and it said it's better wine, then you better believe it's fermented. It's, it's, it, it would be as if it was fermented for 20 years or however many years, 10 years or five years, whatever it would be. You know, in other words, it would be wine that was like the best year a few years ago that you'd be opening. You know, that God couldn't just invent wine. It wouldn't have had time to ferment. That's, that, that thinking is false. That's a way of getting around the truth. There's no wine in the Bible that isn't fermented. When it says wine, it means fermented. Watch out, don't drink too much of it. 
You'll have strange visions. But when Jesus invented it then, it wasn't fermented. Well, if it wasn't fermented, it wouldn't have been the best wine, would it? Couldn't have been. You know, you can get the Mogan David, uh, you know, alcohol-less uh, grape juice, I suppose, that's kosher, and you'd say, you see, that's unfermented, and, and this is what's being used. And I, I don't buy it. I really don't buy it. Wine is wine, you know, and um, it's a way to celebrate food. It's a way to uh, take the edge off. It's a way to get together with people, whatever it's. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's been there. It, it doesn't have to be a, an impediment of getting people drunk. There's nothing worse than a hangover on something like wine. But the point is, is a glass or two of wine, getting together, having a meal, having some wine. When it, it's it's the, fermented. But I'm not to be trusted because I said that Jesus came up with an even better wine, which to me would mean like a year, a few years ago, kind of. Any, you know, because he's God, if it's a miracle, it would automatically be the best wine fermented and all. It, just because he invented it doesn't mean it needed time to ferment. That's ridiculous. But that's what I'm accused of. And um, my answer is, of course, this brother is wrong, but it suits him because he doesn't drink and he wants justification not to have a drink. And, you know, this would... So he's got this... There, there are people that have that with tobacco as well. If you have a smoke, you're, you're being ungodly because you're polluting your temple or whatever it is. Um, in the scriptures, wine is wine. Wine, by its very definition, is fermented. So th that, that's the end of this argument. There is no argument. Um, but the issue of trust, he's not going to trust me. And then my pronunciation of Yahuwah or Yahuwah or Yahuwah, I have to say Yahuwah rather than Yahuwah. And Yahuwah and Yahuwah are two different names. So he jumped on me for that. I'm like, okay. He said, I must be listening to somebody out there. Brother, I don't listen to anybody out there. I haven't been completely trusted. You know, once in a while I'll hear a word, you know, see something on YouTube, you know, and it's inspiring. And, you know, it's, it's going to be the same word. Like I was talking to a sister yesterday about, um, you know, the legal line between light and dark and dark and light. And, you know, if you're anywhere on the other side of that line, you're not with God. I don't care how many Hail Marys, you, I don't care how much devotion you have. If you're on the other side of that line, i.e. conform the world, you are, do not serve God. No matter how many, much Bible study you do, no matter how much you teach, no matter how godly you appear, no matter how many poor people you feed, no matter how many people in prison you feed, no matter how many Bibles you give away, it doesn't really matter. It comes down to the individual. If you're on the wrong side of the line, you're, you're, you're found without. You're weighed in the balances and found wanting. And you are rejected and cast to the art of darkness because you're not dressed for the wedding feast. You are the wrong sort. You're not a lamb. You're not one of God's sheep. You're not a son or daughter of the Most High God. You know all the religious stuff. You've got the body. You've got all, that, all the accoutrements, but you're not real. You may even do less sin than anyone else. And what determines that side of the line? That's your heart, and that's something I can't judge in people because, you know, it's a constantly shifting landscape. I can't judge it. I feel terrible about myself a lot of the time for my weaknesses, infirmities, sins, whatever, for my, my complete ineptitude at times in, in terms of uh, my flesh wanting to, to rule by insecurities, the, you know, the lack of confidence at times. And I feel terrible about all those things. And sometimes they make me want to escape. And they want me to, you know, I want to escape and duck and find shelter somewhere because I don't feel good about myself. I don't feel good about, you know, the, then there's the questions about whether or not, you know, this is all invisible stuff we're talking about. How can you see that line? And what do you know? And then I feel bad about people having persecuted, criticized, attacked me for whatever reason, and then causing me to question my own walk, and then wondering, well, am I on the right side of the line? See, I'm talking about it. And, you know, going to the Lord and saying, you know, how would we know that? Look at the way I'm acting. Look at how they're kicking me all over the field today. 
look at how I'm being, I'm simply reacting. I'm not acting as a godly person. I'm reacting to, um, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm separate from a lot of things and then I'm feeling the persecution from that. And I'm not having the equipping of God to deal with it. I'm not meeting it with a joyful heart. I'm not rejoicing and being exceedingly glad for, for that means I'm on the right track. I'm not doing any of those things. I'm taking it on the chin. I'm resenting it. I'm getting mad about it. I'm reclusing myself. I'm, um, you know, hating humanity, and 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 until I get straightened out. And then I realize there is nothing I can do to change that unless God enters me and fixes it. So then I get mad at God. Well, why don't you fix it? You want me to be a really godly person? You don't want me to act all godly? Well, God doesn't want anyone to act as like a hypocrite, but you know, you want me to have that, that, I want that Holy Spirit inside radiating out with confidence. I just want to be your vehicle, Lord, and just go here and there and just do your bidding and just be a happy servant. And, and that's it. Well, what, what's in the way of that? Well, you've been given challenges and you're beleaguered and you're barely holding on, aren't you? You've been given temptations and you're barely holding on. You're barely able to keep the, the rudder and the ship going the right way. Look, if I throw stuff at you, look at how you go off and you're not staying the course. And then in the end of the day, it's like, yes, but you are staying the course because you're still on track. Even though you feel bad about it, you've been given extra stresses and extra thing as a test. And it doesn't matter how messy you are, my son, it doesn't matter how, how screwed up or self-loathing or, or, or those things, as long as you stay the course, despite your shenanigans and your weaknesses, you're still on course, right? You're still, you're still the same. You know, it's still the same thing. You haven't made any deals with, the, with them. You, know, you're, you, you could have, but you, you're, 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 you're suffering. You, you look like you don't have it together to people. You look disheveled, and 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 um, that's proof that you're you're still my son. <laughs> oh, being disheveled and being a loser and being you know and and being selfish and being self-absorbed and criticizing myself and self-loathing and self-hatred and and then you know the, the hating the the world and and all this other stuff and then um, being confused and then wandering around and not feeling good and not feeling confident and not feeling you mean. That pleases you? What kind of a, a fool's paradise have I fallen into? That pleases you when the world puts a premium on acting together, wearing the right clothes, having the right haircut, having a, a good presentation, being really um, proper, Going to the wedding and wearing the right things or going to the funeral and having the right, or going to the, the graduation or all the other kind of vetting operations we have in this uh, society of ours and, 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 you know, appearing the right way and look, it looks like you got it together. You know, God's really working through you. No, I look at you, Zeph, and you're all untogether and you're disheveled, you're all over the place and, you know, God's definitely not uh, dealing with you, Job. And then let's try another thing. Let's throw uh, opportunity your way. Let's see how you deal with that. Well, you're not dealing with that very well either. See? But I'm still on the course, even though I'm a mess and terrible. And it pains me to think I can't be... And then I realize that if I'm really honest with myself, I'll look in the mirror and go, you know what? Last couple of weeks, I couldn't have been any better. It's not like, I knew better. I could have done... No. Lord, I couldn't have done any better. That was the best I could do, and it was terrible. And I didn't have it in me to do any better. And it's just that weak. I'm weak. You gotta, you gotta be strong. You gotta just lead me. You know, you gotta, you gotta intercede for me and pray for me because you can see I'm walking off the cliff every minute. And he does. I look like a mess to other people. Yes, by my design, son. Why is that your design? So that you. Uh, you know, they leave you alone, you leave them alone. Uh, the less connections to that, the better. Because you want to be loved. 
because you're insecure and you want love. Can't have that. Can't have that. That's, that's, that's going to put you in danger. Danger of then becoming something else other than my son. So you see how it gets? You can imagine if you went into a church as disheveled as I am, they would all flock around trying to help me when I might be the only one in the whole dang place that really has it going on and yet I would be the one totally criticized and they would want to counsel me and come talk to me and they want to assess my sins. Oh, no, you drink too much. I'm smoking a vape stick, that's not right. That's a lot of espresso. and You know, whatever. <laughs> it's like... Okay, stop prophesying. Stop talking. Don't write anything. Stop doing those, those blasphemous music. That's not serving God. We need to get control. You need to kind of settle down, you know, and kind of like take instruction and be a good servant here at the church. And then, you know, maybe a couple of years from now, we'll be able to release you. You'll be wearing a pair of Dockers and a nice, you know, golf shirt and nice set of, Penny loafers and socks. You don't even wear socks. You know what? What the? You you just, you're unpresentable. That that's not God. No, God is not the author of just disheveledness and and being a mess. Well, what if it, if I'm right, and I, and I probably am. Um, God would be using me to confound them and be, be, to make them into a joke. You see what I mean? It, 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 they would be ministering to me when quite the opposite would be necessary. Even, even though I'd be asked to leave their churches because you're a disheveled mess, you don't have any self-respect. You know, God doesn't seem to be working through you. You know, you're, you're, not, you're, you're, you're obviously in need of assistance or something. We've tried to help you, but inside you just resist because you have pride and you have, you know, there's just something wrong with you. You know, you need deliverance. We need to cast that demon out of pride so that you can get, kind of get with the group and, you know, see what it's all about. Well, I've seen what it's all about because I'm now coming into my almost uh, senior citizen status. So I have seen what it's all about and I uh, fought it. Well, that's just foolish pride, and you know you're not. Uh, we're we're of God, and we can see that you need help. You need to just lower your fighting and whatever it is you're doing, and just kind of assimilate. And and you know, you know you're not important. And God's important, and let God work through you. You shouldn't be afraid of church or fellowships or groups of people, and you know, stay away. Stay away because you feel unacceptable. That right there means you need deliverance of some kind. You are perfectly acceptable. Come on in, but don't uh, don't put up a wall with your pride. I mean, you know that, that we're going to have to break that down because God doesn't like that. We're all in the same boat, and you, no one's more important than anyone else. And you need to get with a group and kind of, you know, start cooperating. And you know, we're the body of Christ, and and then everything's going to be okay. But don't talk about politics now. No more politics, no more Zeph report. All that stuff has to stop. It's all hateful. Now, I've had that exact conversation maybe dozens and dozens and dozens of times from people on the internet, in churches, wherever. You name it, they've, they've given me that litany. Now they don't bother anymore because I'm just a lost cause. But isn't it ironic? And then on the same time, I act atrocious. And I dress atrociously, and I, I, I hate my slobbishness. <laughs> Using myself as an example is not really, um, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about myself here so much. I'm kind of using myself as, a, as an example of a bigger picture. It's quite possible, in other words, that the people of God would be unacceptable to all institutions in the world just because of that. And the people of God may have not chosen it. 
they may have been chosen. It may not have been their idea, but God just picked them, whether they liked it or not. And, you know, I prayed to God, to, you know, I'll clean my act up and take the ring. And, and, and I feel like going, oh, I need counseling. What, I need someone to say, what's wrong? With Why am I resisting? The flesh is too strong. My need to react, to hate myself and, and others, to hate others as I hate myself. <laughs> my need to do those things, my flesh seems to overpower me. Lord, where are you? Why can't you just take the desire away? Because those desires keep you where I want you. Your infirmities keep you where I want you. Don't worry, one day you'll be restored, but your version of restored that you have in your mind is vanity. One day you'll be okay in your own mind and you're not now, but your version of what's okay is vanity. And you're just going to have to die to that. And stop thinking there's something wrong with you that you need to be, improve or quit apologizing for yourself to other people. That's vanity, narcissism. That's, a, the, that's you know, you're going to have to let that go before things are going to get better. It's not the same resistance I'm talking about when you come up against the, uh, the dogs of conformity that want everyone to be the same thing and all go to hell together singing Kumbaya. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the idea that, you know, you've got afflictions and there's a point where you say, you know what, I got these afflictions and I couldn't do any better. That's the best I could do and it wasn't good enough. And you know what, I know in my heart of hearts, I couldn't do any better. So Lord, you've got to take me. I can't do it. I am limited. I can't do it. I'm weak. I can't do any better. I can't explain it all. You get my drift, right? Catching my drift? There's a point where we just have to say, that was my best. Yep. It wasn't like beat yourself up because you could have done better. No. Unfortunately, that was my best and I couldn't do any better. And I'm not going to beat myself up because I know that was, that was all I... That's as good as I could do, and it was lousy, but I, I knew I couldn't do better, so I'm not going to beat myself up on it. That's like step one. The other thing is like acceptance. You know, Lord, you may want me to be afflicted in this way for this time, and he, praying for healing, I'm, I'm going to just leave it in your hands. If I have afflictions, I have pains that I can't get rid of, and I ask you for healing and they're still there, it doesn't mean you don't love me. It means that for some reason you've, put that thorn in my side and it needs to be there, you know, I'm going to give up uh, resistance to it. I'm going to accept that it's there. I'm not going to say it's, an, it's unacceptable anymore, thus hating you. And I'm going to say it's acceptable because I understand it's there for a purpose and I'm just going to give up on that. So what's happening? I'm being broken, right? I'm being broken. Not by man, but I'm being broken by the Spirit, broken by the Lord, broken by my Father. And he's keeping me in a state of brokenness. And I'm now beginning to appreciate the brokenness rather than saying, I need a healing. I need rehabilitation. I need to lose weight. I need to do this. I need to do that. And then I'll be, no, I'm going to give up on it all because you know what? With all these issues, I've done the best I could do. For some reason, you wanted me to be afflicted in that way. Um, maybe you just, maybe I would be a complete arrogant idiot if I had everything going I had it going on you see guys you know you see guys out there that, you know they're 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 growing old you know very graceful they're in great shape they're they seem to have you know the right clothes they they have the they seem to appreciate everything they seem so godly and so put together and you're tempted to go up and say hey what's your secret I'd like to be like you And then you find out all that glitters is not gold, don't you? I'm not saying that person's bad. I'm just saying, you know, more often than not, people that seem to have it all together really don't in terms of the spirit. They may in terms of the flesh. 
But that, you know, you know, I'm not saying that all people that have it going on in the spirit are a mess in the flesh. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that I've seen that, that kind of thing. Doesn't mean it's across the board or, you know, all or nothing. I just have seen that where I've envied people that uh, seem to have it together and I want to emulate them and I want to be better and darn it, tomorrow I'm going to wake up and really dedicate myself to doing all the right things. I want to be like them, you know. I'm going to clean my act up, darn it. Now, I could do better. Well, I'm here to tell you, you know, confess. No, I can't do better. I mean, I really know I can't do better. I, I'm up against a force that's so much stronger than me. I just can't, by my self-will, go ahead and put it together. You know, you, you, you see, uh, you know, uh, I think Frankie was showing me this, like, uh, he had lost weight lately doing low carb and low calorie. I'm not sure exactly what he was doing, but he had a thing called My Diet Buddy or something like that online where you log in what you've eaten and different things. And he'd been successful in losing weight. And um, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm doing that too. And then the more I tried to do that, the more I kept screwing it up. <laughs> and finally, I just gave up. It just seems like every time that's what I run into. So it's like, okay, okay, what, what's going on here? It's got to be between me and God. I mean, what's going on here? Why are you leaving me afflicted? In this? Why can't you let me improve myself? Seems that when I entered into the God thing, you know, and really entered into consciousness about being a son of God, I lost my ability to clean my act up. Lost, I lost the ability to be self-willed like I used to be. You know, I, I would just, through determination and, and just sheer will, I could fix it. And now I realize I, can, I can't fix it. That, that thing seems to be gone. In other words, Christ to me was, part of it was that part dying. That self-will. Being able to just go change my circumstances. Pull myself up by my bootstraps. It seems that I, every time I set out a course to, to make an improvement in that way, something goes wrong and then I'm realizing it's supernatural. It's beyond my strength. You know, and sometimes it's like, well, you know, witches throw some kind of a, a whammy on me or whatever and, I, and I'm afflicted. And then I say, Lord, can't you take that off? They threw this whammy and, I'm, and they just kind of hurt me and I'm, you know, you know, compromised in the physical. And it's like, no, I'm going to leave that there. Because what they did ultimately is for my purpose. And the afflictions you have now are for my purpose. And you'll see in the end, it's going to be glorious. You just kind of have to be patient and trust me that, you know, what you consider afflictions, one day you're going to be calling blessings. But you're going to have to be patient. Life doesn't mean you're going to have no pain. Everybody has pain, no matter what affiliation they have, no matter what side of the aisle they're on, they're going to have pain. There's only two sides of the aisle, by the way. There's two sides. That's it, not three. I love these new ages that kind of, you know, say, oh, you got to let it go. You got to let all that resentment and shame and anger and all that deep down go. And usually those people are the angriest people of all. I saw this guy on, um, you know, he's on YouTube and he's like a health guru type of guy. And he's just saying, you got to let that go. That deep issue, if you become obese or whatever, or, you know, those are deep issues of resentment and anger and shame and guilt and uh, remorse. And you got to let all that go. And then I, I'm looking at him and he's all resentful and, 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 and angry at anyone who would criticize him and, 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 you know, all this personal animus. And it's just exuding out of him, his anger and his resentment. And he's telling people to lose the angry resentment that if you just eat fruits and vegetables, you too can be like a really anointed, uh, highly ethereal, spiritual guy. And this guy is just down and he's just in the carnal flesh. And it's like, wait a minute, I thought eating vegetables and and fruits and being a raw food person would make you anointed. Nope. Nope. It's all little petty things with him. You know, it's the comment on YouTube. It's this, it's that. It's just petty little arguments and, and trying to tell people how to live and then having this anger about anyone who sees it differently than him. I'm like, okay, well then I guess the fruits and vegetables didn't deliver you. I think I'll stick with my lamb and, and burgers. Thanks. That's not causing resentment in me. The Lord having to teach me how to eat and say, you know, really, when I put something before you, 
you should just pray my blessing on it and be grateful. If people feed you something, pray my blessing on it. If you're not sure if the food's toxic or not, pray my blessing on it. Let me feed you. No, I'm going to go on this diet and then I'm really going to be okay. I'm going to eat a certain way then I'm really going to be okay. If I take these supplements, I'm really going to be okay. If I can just find a way, if, here's the way to live. You take these supplements, eat fruits and vegetables, and then the ethereal, you know, all the resentment, and the anger goes, and it's just love, baby. That's what it's all about. It's just, you just got to surrender to love. And Zeph, I promise you, you surrender to love, everything's going to be all right. The whole world will be your brothers and sisters. Everything's going to be cool. You got to let that stuff go. So if I eat fruits and vegetables and no protein, then it's easy to break me down so I can really love unless you go against the will of the honchos and then all of a sudden there's tremendous anger and hate and even murderous intent. <laughs> now, I like pleasure too. Yeah, I like having a glass of champagne and I'm just trying to think of food, a rack of lamb I really like. You know, I'm just like that. I'm like, you know, God ordained that lamb to... Uh, to feed us, and um, and I like vegetables and, and fruits, and I love the way they're made. I like I like mangoes, the way a mango is made. I like coconuts. I like I like all kinds of things that God has. I like the juniper berries that we have out here. Um, I ate in a restaurant where they they served the the best wine and the best rack of lamb ever. It was so good that, and little potatoes, it was just, so, it was a, I, I couldn't tell you the name of the restaurant. It was out in California and it was, it was just like the next day I felt this benefit, all this kind of energy from it. And I, um, you know, it was just, a, and then I had some leftover. They gave me, you know, double portion. They gave me two racks on there. You could only eat one, you know, just like you'd buy in a store but for two people. They, that was the portion. So I took the half home and I had it the next morning. It was just a wonderful breakfast. I think that's my favorite food. I think the rack is, rack alone is the f favorite of all. And um, no, I was so grateful. I kind of, and I realized I was on a turning thing. And I, the, I don't know what it was. It was just, I look back on it. And like I say, the wine was perfect and the, the, the food was perfect and the <clears throat> the waiter was perfect and the, and the you know, the, Vibe was good and the people in there were all, you know, enjoying their pleasures of, you know, good food and wine and getting together and talking and enjoying one another. And, you know, that's something, by the way, the brethren of God always loves to do when they, when they do it. And um, I think all people like that, you know, and I, and, and then it was over and then it was over. And then I was left with a well, you can't do that every day. You know, that was a special moment and it becomes a special memory and it was a particularly good time and we were with particularly, you know, nice people and, and it was just uh, great, you know. Um, but, you know, it was a little glimpse. But again, can't take it with me. If I kept going back to that restaurant, whatever it was, you know, eventually that pleasure would wane because it's like if you keep eating dessert over and over again, it just becomes meaningless. Again, trying to find a way to live, dealing with time and space. Dealing with time and space, being in the will of God or the will of the world. The conflict within, wanting to be liked and loved, i.e. the world, versus going it alone with God. And it's like you know, not being sure if he's still there. And, you know, then, and then, you know, I'm the world again and then I'm God again. And then being a mess in between. But I assure you, those of you who can relate, every step you're taking has been preordained. God has every step you're taking. That insecurity, not knowing it's there, then he is there, then you push in further. I just pray right now in Jesus' name, in the name of God, in the name of Yahweh, Elohim God, the one, Jesus Christ. I pray that this comfort on all these issues comes to all the, by that this message is a complete and total 100% healing and release from all the self-loathing and self-judgments that we make 
and the accepting that, you know, we did our best and it wasn't good enough. And that's why we need our Savior, why we need his spirit in us at all times, why we can do nothing on our own, but only through Christ who strengthens us. Lord, we are weak. You are strong. We are a mess. You are, you are beautiful. We don't have it together. You do have it together. Everything is wrong with me. Everything is right with you. Lord, I need you to complete my life. I've seen them out there try to imitate you. They do a very good job looking like they're all together. But you know what? They're all slaves. I see the slavery, you know, that they are beholden to something in order to have that effect on the exterior of their beings. And in Jesus' name, I pray for this comfort to come to all of you, whether you think you're fat, old, ugly, and stupid, um, in situations and you're with spouses, bosses, this, that, or the other thing, where you feel like you're a slave, you don't have, your will doesn't really matter, just remember this. The Lord had all kinds of people who were slaves upon the earth, but they were free in Christ. And when they do their work for their master, it's not like they're doing their work for the master. They're doing their work for the Lord, and it's benefiting the master because that, in concert with his will, he put you in that situation. Nobody said you were going to be free on earth in the flesh anyway. Everyone is beholden to a boss, or this or that, and there's a kind of a form of just agreeable slavery with all of it. But we're not slaves. The only freedom we have is in Christ. Then there's freedom. But yes, there's a hierarchy. There's a boss. There's people that tell you what to do, and then you do it. And then, you know, in exchange for that, maybe you get money, you get this, you get that. Um, you know, that can't be the end of, of, of it, or you are a slave. No, but in Christ, you're free. So now you go do that work for the Lord, honoring that he put you there, and it does benefit the master. You know, it benefits Pharaoh, right? Joseph's work benefited Pharaoh, and even when he was the, you know, the top of Pharaoh's kingdom, he was still a slave. People don't know that. Joseph was not free in that position under Pharaoh. He was still a bondservant. Still the same slave that he was when he was in prison. It's a not nicer situation, but it was still that hierarchical thing. How do we escape that? In the spirit, we're free. Who gives us that? The door is Jesus. Open that door and there's freedom. So though you serve your masters, you have freedom in the spirit. When, when you die, the proof is when you die, you don't go to your master's house. You go to the Lord. But everyone has a master. Everyone has people that are over them. My, my feeling is I, I used to, you know, I don't assert my will too often. I have, you know, if I have someone to answer to, I just let them, you know, whatever you want to do is fine with me. Because I don't have that much vested in it. I just root for the best thing to happen. See? I don't feel like I need to assert my authority or my will in this world. I mean, if it's come to me to assert my authority, I will. Maybe I, in these talks, I do assert my authority as being a, a handler of the word of God, as being chosen to do this, yes. But in things of the earth, no. I don't have any real power in the earth, and I'm, you know, I basically, you know, follow the rules and, you know, whatever. With that, I bid you shalom, shalom. I love you. I'm praying for you. I wouldn't make any, you know, people have written me saying, um, where are you? In the last month, I've been busy. You know, there have been things on my plate and I have taken a break from uh, broadcasting and from the live radio. And I'm, not, I'm just kind of assessing. It's kind of a time. I'm in what you might call an intermission of my life. We did 10 years straight on the Zephyr Report. And it was, did a lot of good and it hurt too. You know, it hurt at times. And, uh, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, I wouldn't change a thing. And now it's all kind of uncharted territory like we started off talking about today. It's uncharted territory. So I'm not quite sure exactly where it's going. I know that I'm... Uh, busy kind of building a studio, small, you know, it's like a, a composer suite and, you know, um, right now dealing with the room and knocking out the ceiling and, you know, doing acoustic things and trying to get it ready, you know, to occupy with, um, 
gear and how that what what comes out of that studio i don't know yet i mean i know that you know this podcast is being brought to you via my ipad which is a tremendous instrument and i've really helped me to facilitate the things i have to do um if i have things to sign and things to do I, i'm able to do those things right from the ipad and um without paper without having to you, you know what i mean without having a computer even um, it's really helped streamline my life along with the iPhone and things like that. Um, but in terms of building this thing, it's, it takes time, you know, and I haven't really been been very busy working on a uh, an album project and, and that's going. But right now I'm, I have, I'm feeling I have to get this room done before I can kind of go and finish that. And, you know, that's... Um, you know, I'm not, it's not going to just be one of these things where I put an album out on the internet as I've done or put it on CD Baby as I've done or any of those kind of things or put a single out. No such thing. No, no, there's a story. It's a very, it's, a, it's quite a mystery, this uh, album. It's quite a mystery what's going on. It's, it's a complete supernatural mystery as to how and who and what and um, it's not even something I'll be talking about. It's, it, it won't be talked about here. I mention it now so you understand that I've been, you know, busy with that and busy with uh, some other things. And we've had to shore up our house and strengthen the foundation and repair the roof. And, do, you know, it's just, it's come to a time of clean, having to clean up after like a 10-year run. And the Lord's given me unction to do it. And I'm very grateful because um, it looks like well, I'm not moving anywhere. I'm in my beloved New Mexico, which uh, in northern New Mexico, where its fires are burning completely out of control, and, and they did last year as well. And, you know, there's all kinds of dangers here. It's not the beach. You know, it's not, you know, what most people think of paradise, but it's, for me, it is, though. You know, it's my home. You know, it's, it's my land, my place. And the Lord I've made it very clear, but I can't take it with me. You know, I'm... I'm, I'm this is it. So, uh, so there's an intermission, and I'm really busy with with some other things, and and um, you know some um, those things help me to sustain my life. So they're very important to take care of, and um, and then these podcasts are kind of coming back in. I think this word was really, you know, I'm looking back on it now, amazed uh, the word we got. I'm getting the word just like you are, but I'm amazed. So many people are afflicted with the things we talked about today. So many people are involved, especially in the United States and Western culture, of self-berating, self-criticalness, and um, you know, and this this torturous thing between the two, two the two ways. And it's 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 a it's a horrendous battle. It's, a, it's an epic battle. And so, this word was necessary for the strengthening of the body. And with that, I bid you shalom. I'll see you. Next time, Zef Daniel, roving reporter on the Zef Report. <laughs>